So hello everyone and welcome to Calculus grade 12. And today we're going to start our class number 12, I believe. And today I'm going to introduce you into a wonderful world of curve sketching based on knowledges you get so far in this course. Because before that in your school, in your math courses, you probably graphed uh, your functions, you sketch them using massive, um, for example, value tables, right? Alan Yusuf, can you tell a few things about what you used before to sketch the graph? Graph paper. Um, definitely, and pencil. But yeah. um, in terms of, um, oh, I sharp. would say in 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 terms of uh, uh, methods. Um, I mean, maybe some of the algorithms that you know. T charts, test points. Mm -hmm. So basically, you were evaluating function for several points the skip plotting those points on the graphing paper and connecting it by nice and smooth curve right mm -hmm. but today we're going to look into more advanced methods involving derivatives and it's really entertaining let's move on to our outcomes of today's class and as a result of uh, our activities today you're going to be able to identify increasing and decreasing functions uh, at a particular interval or in generally defined uh, domain of a function. And you're also going to be able to apply new methods to analyze property of the function at an interval. And those methods are pretty convenient, I would say. And they're widely used in different areas of human life for example stock market stock market is hardly uh, depends on mathematics in this particular area because they're all most of their calculations involving uh, knowledges that this part of calculus gives you so is this unit four pardon is this unit four yeah, is this unit 4.1? Wow, we're doing unit three. Uh, we're gonna make a step back later to unit three once you finish your home assignment, because uh, we gotta review it together. I'm gonna answer for more of your questions because so far, um, I feel like you haven't touched it by yourself enough yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but we already reviewed all the required theoretical material in our last class and class before that mm -hmm. um, basically you can refer to reading material in your google drive in order to review your memory mm -hmm. and of course ask me if you have any questions yeah so let's move on and i bet this was one of your favorite functions and it's parabola, of course, it's x square. And uh, this quadratic function is preferred by many uh, mathematicians because it's quite simple and we know how it acts. So far you interacted with this function a lot of time and you know that it has one clear vertex on it, uh, after which the function changes direction to the opposite one. Am I right? Yeah. So um, if we imagine a particular moving along this parabola from left to right, we can see that while the x coordinate of the ordered pairs steadily increase, the y coordinates of the ordered pairs along the part uh, particles pass first decrease and then increase. So that's what we can see on the graph. Uh, in this range, let me take uh, Angry's teacher's pen red color. If we take a look at the, our graph in this range from x negative 2 to x 0, 
we can see that y coordinate in this range. So this would be our y1, right? And this would be our y2 because function moving from left to right. Am I right? Yeah. This is this point located on the at y axis at point around four, uh, five to six, right? Looks like it. And uh, y2 is positioned at y equals zero. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah. So I can state that as x1 travels to x2, my y1 travels to y2. Am I correct? And along this path, I see that y co coordinate constantly decreasing, right? So y1 is greater than y2 when x1 is less than x2. Yeah. Do you see this uh, dependence in this graph? Yeah. Yeah. So this, I would say, let me frame it. I love this tool repertoire. So this would be our left side. Our left side. And our right side would have uh, as x from x2 travels, let's say, to x3, right? And y2 travels to y1. In this case, from y2, we're going to y1. So y2 is less than y1. And x2 is less than x3. This is what we see on the right hand side of our graph. So now, as we travel from x2 to x3, when value of x changes from left to right, our function value changes from 0 to 6 which means it changes in positive direction. So, or in another word, every next y from zero to two is going to be greater than the previous one. It, what would you say about it? Is it clear? Yeah, it's pretty clear. So yeah. Let me save this for future. Maybe we're gonna need it. So determining the intervals in which a function increases and decreases is extremely useful for understanding the behavior of the function. The following statements give a clear picture. So um, what I can say here, you're going to see why determining intervals is important maybe in your future when you're going to encounter real life graphs. And uh, for now, I can say that we already discovered some um, optimization problems or rate of change problems where we saw that how our graph changes is important for our decision making. Because when we talked about a business strategy, Remember, we had a graph of total cost to the total revenue. Guys? Yeah. Do you recall that uh, exercise? Yeah, I recall it, yeah. Yeah. So there, we also were looking for moment when 
in that particular case, we were looking for a moment when total profit is greater than total uh, cost, right? But we also can look for signals like when the graph is decreasing and when it's growing up. Because if we see that graph is decreasing, it may indicate that if we go further along the line, we may meet then second minimum of a function, for example, right? Because if we know that function is decreasing after a certain point, it means that it, it's either going to decrease forever, right, for infinity, or it's going to reach it local minimum value. This is what we discovered in our last class. Mm -hmm. Do you recall that, guys? When function has a derivative equals zero, it states that it's going to be either local minimum or local maximum of function. Yeah. Great. So let me clear the drawing and move to the next slide. Here's the definition of an interval. Uh, where, whether it's increasing or decreasing. You see, this is what I listed to you on the screen before. But I, instead of using f of x, I just wrote it in terms of y and x. Okay. Please write it down into your textbooks, and uh, we're going to move on. Yeah. Any questions so far? So if a par oh, I'm just gonna ask one question. So if a parabola is like this, put it down the middle. This uh, left side would be decreasing. The right side would be increasing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And if we get like a question like this, this side, right side would be increasing so would the left side uh so you suggesting that here function acts like a straight line that is parallel to x axis no, 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 no. Is that it's, what you say it's, it's just uh an error writing it's it's going up slowly uh it's going up slowly to the left yeah because it's an exponential mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the you would say point. that function grows at the whole domain of x. Because if it's exponential function like x square, right? But it's going to look a little bit different. If it's exponential x square, it's going to look like this, right? Yeah. This you expressed, uh, I believe it's, log function logarithm function because remember log function is oh, we're going ahead away from the past but log function is a function of exponent right what exponent we if it's log of base n of m m and here we have b b is the power of n to get m right no. If our power is negative, it's going to be, and this is what is going to be our x. Oh, sorry. This is going to be our. Uh, that's the function I drew. I, I wasn't talking about logs. Oh, so yeah. if you drew x squared? Yeah. Oh, no. Is it x squared? It's the exponential. Uh, uh, sorry. Think... Oh, oh, sorry. The, what's the exponential parent function? Is exponential it, function, it means... Uh, is it y over one half? It means variable raised to the power. Exponential function, for example, x well, squared is exponential function. I drew uh, um, this one here. It's a uh, 2x. That's oh, I it. know. Uh, th this is... This, is this 2x? Oh, yeah. It could be 2x. Or 
Another funny function that you're going to discover later is going to be e to the power x. e, it's an Euler's number. Very, very remarkable number in mass. I strongly recommend you go to YouTube, maybe after this class, maybe on your leisure, and Google Euler's number because it basically turned calculus upside down. Yeah. Are we going to learn that in the seat? Um, yes, when we're gonna discover different uh, dif derivatives of exp uh, exp of log function and o Euler function, we're gonna find derivative of e to the power x, and also derivative of log of x, for example, to some base, some coefficient equals y. We're also going to find derivatives like that. But let's not deviate from our course today. OK, guys? And in this case, you would say that if you're looking from left to right on this function, function grows at all domain of the function. A rate, just rate of change is different. Here, rate of rate of change is less than here because tangent line would be less inclined to the left side of the y-axis and it would be more steep to the right-hand side of the y-axis. But it's still going to have positive angle. Remember, because when function decreases, your tangent line would have negative angle, so would uh, um, relatively to the x-axis, our tangent line gonna look down because when function grows, our tangent line looks up. You see this? Yeah. Does it ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. Because we're also worked with derivatives and we saw that when derivative is negative, it means function decreasing. And when derivative is, derivative is positive, it means function is increasing, am I right? So yeah. for, for your example, when two to the power X, uh, here derivative would be positive all the time. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. The derivative would be positive all the time, but rate of change would be different over the domain. So maybe move further. So for the parabola, with the equation y equals x squared, the change from decreasing y values to increasing y values occurs at zero, zero, right? This is what we discovered. The vertex of the parabola, this is gonna be point zero, zero. The function f of x equals x squared is decreasing on the interval x less than zero. Is it clear? Because when I said, uh, in previous example, then I have x1 and x2. It, it, it doesn't mean that x1 and x2 covers whole uh, domain of my function here. Do you understand why? Because exponential function like this, x squared, is infinite to the left and right from the y-axis. You can, um, is it right? It's, it's just gonna grow co constantly upwards, but we mean we, we, we are enabled to represent it on the limited space. So our range would be X less than zero to the left hand side from the Y axis. So, I have a question. If we find, a, if we find the slope of these tangent lines, would they be negative? Absolutely right. So that's why it's we know it's uh, decreasing. Uh, you're running ahead of your time. I learned that in chemistry today. So wow. 
I don't know. And that's a great chemistry class. Well, he's a really good teacher. Yes. So. But is that right? Pardon? Was that right? Uh, exactly, yes. To the left-hand side, in this case, when function is decreasing, derivative of a function at a specific point, at any point to the left-hand side from zero, is going to have negative value. Mm. Okay, I understand this. So basically, if derivative is going to be negative to this tangent lines, it also means that the slope of these lines is going to be negative. So a negative, yeah. Negative slope. So looking downwards relatively to the x axis. So negative slope means it's decreasing? Absolutely. Okay. So, any questions about this? No. No, this one is good, yeah. So, similarly to what we discovered to the left-hand side, to the right-hand side, we're going to see that all derivatives are positive, as well as slope of tangent lines are positive. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I like our pace today. And let's move on a little further. So here, this is statement that we just came to with you together, guys, that we are looking into the sign of the derivative, in fact, because um, for a continuous indifferentiable function, that's really important that derivative should exist for this function, right? In, in order for us to use this method to verify it, to verify whether function grows or decreases uh, then on an interval. If we can't differentiate the function there, how can we say what value derivative has there? Am I right? Yeah. So for continuous and differentiable function, the function values, y values, are increasing for all x values where derivative is greater than zero and function values y are decreasing for x values where derivative is less than zero. I hope it, we verified it. Oh, and actually here you can see when this function is going to be positive and when it's going to be negative. dy over dx, this is derivative of y, right? Yeah. So this is what we're getting after differentiating x squared. And I'm pretty confident you did this before. For example, when you were working with modular expression, you state that no matter what value x takes, modular expression is always greater than zero. Yeah. Greater or equal to zero. So in this case, we would like to analyze when is this function positive or negative. As soon as I have coefficient 2 times x, Coefficient 2 is positive no matter what. But x is the variable that can take values from negative uh, infinity all the way up to the positive infinity. Oh, okay. am, I right? am I right? Yeah. So, and as soon as I know coordinate system, it should be pretty intuitive for me to understand that whenever x is negative, this whole expression is going to be negative. And when is x is negative? When x is less than zero. So whenever x is less than zero, it's negative, yeah. This is going to be less than zero. As well as if x greater than zero, two times x would be greater than zero. And you see, now we analyze derivative. 
in order to understand how our function acts at the specific range. Now you know why x squared is symmetrical over y axis. It's not just a random stuff. You see, this is exactly what we see here. It's a symmetry over y-axis. So yeah. vertical, oh, so horizontal symmetry. We also have vert vertical symmetry over x-axis. So can I clear the drawing here? Uh, yeah, I got it done. Alan, are you okay? Yeah. So let's move on. So consider the following graph of the derivative. Now we have parabola that is not a function, but it's a derivative of some function. And we have to graph f of x. So we need to graph the function that was differentiated and gave us this beautiful derivative. Mm -hmm. So I, I would ask you one extra question. What would be the greatest power of x in the mm -hmm. function that gave us such a derivative? Two. At y? Parabola. Yes, but uh, parabola is a derivative, not the function function was something else. If derivative has power oh, two, it so that, means- That's the derivative right here? Yes, you see oh, here it uh, says derivative of uh, three. f of x. So yes, uh, it would be exponential function with power three. And what do we know about them? Um, they're always increasing. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't agree with you because I don't know what is oh. what is that that I'm raising to the third power. If I'm raising, uh, for example, yeah. some fracture to the third power, it won't be always raised. It would be quite opposite, always decreasing. Always or, accelerating? Huh? It's always accelerating? Can we say that? So let, let's let's slow down and I, I, I'm not sure we can say that and you're gonna see why. So first of all, if this is derivative, let's analyze the derivative graph, okay? Let's analyze what we have. Let's not try to imagine too much about what we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Let's extract information from this derivative graph. And um, what we know about derivative, Whenever x is greater, no, no, no. Wherever is derivative, f prime of x is greater than zero, it means that the function, initial function, is going up, right? Yeah. Whenever derivative is less than zero, it means that the initial function is going down. Whenever our derivative changes its sign whenever, for example, before that we had negative and then we have positive, it means we have a vertex. So we reach local minimum or, or local maximum. This is local minimum. And this is local maximum. Maximum, yeah. We also know that, remember? because derivative here would be positive, here it would be negative. Here it would be positive again. Make sense? Yeah. So let's go ahead and take a look at the derivative graph. So from the point, let's say from minus one, let this point be minus one, okay? Everybody agrees with that? Yeah. From when x is less than minus one, derivative f prime of x is 
greater than zero. Am I right? Yeah. Next step. Whenever X is in the range from whenever X is greater than minus one and uh, less than three, this point, F, o, F prime of X is going to be less than zero. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. And now final, uh, final section. Let me just add something on this graph. I would like to make it more lovely. So let's split it up like this. Um, So we have now we see that we have three areas. We have left hand side. And the right hand side. We have left hand side, right hand side, and the middle one. In this in this particular case, we have three areas. Because our derivative looks like this and it takes specific position on the graphing paper, right? In mm -hmm. another case, it could be it could have vertex in zero zero, but you never know. And finally, third region, we're gonna have x greater than three. Then the function again is greater than zero. Yeah. So let's connect this knowledge with what we know so far. When function is greater than zero, it grows. When it's less than zero, it decreases. And when it's greater, it grows again. So we can say that from in minus infinity to minus one, function was growing. Then from minus one to three, it was decreasing. So it reached its local maximum, right? Because it was growing and started in, and fell off a cliff at the end, right? Yeah basically what happened to the function so some in the point x equals minus one we reached local maximum okay yeah. let's say it would be somewhere here and from minus one to three function was going down so here function was going down here it was going up and here it's going up again. Now I know that after point three, my function changed direction again. So at point three, I would say I have a local minimum because I was dropping down and I bounce off the floor and I go up. Make sense? Yeah. So let's say in three, somewhere here was my local minimum. Let me try to move this aside. Oh, nice and clear. So if I were to plot this function, I need to start at minus infinity somewhere here below the screen, right? Because mm -hmm. before this point, I was coming from below. I was climbing up to this point. So it would increase, 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 increase all the way up to this point when x equals minus one. And from minus one to three, I would drop down. Again, I would, my value would decrease. Am I right? Yeah but it would decrease at different rate because you see value of a slope. Uh, here it's y at this point here, then y at this point, this is the lowest y we get for the derivative specifically, not for the initial function. And remember that the value of the derivative is specifically related to the angle of a slope, right? So at some places here, function would decrease faster, 
you understand, or decrease slower, it would have different rate of change. Is it clear? How did we get the first point again? Well, uh, let me finish sketching the graph and we're gonna get back to it, okay? Okay. So, point three will reach some local minimum. So this was our local minimum. And from here on, we start raising up again. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, let me clean up it a little bit. So ask your question. How did we get the points again? So I don't know where this point located exactly mm -hmm. on Y axis. Mm -hmm. But I know where this point located on x axis because x coordinate is similar for function as well as for its derivative. Mm -hmm. So I know that at this point, yeah. uh, let me just visualize it for you. Okay. So here I have this line passing uh, through the x axis. Here, where uh, where function intersects x, you see? Yeah. Where function intersects x, my derivative changes uh, sign from positive to negative. Yeah. Here, in another point, 3, my function does it again. My derivative does it again. Yeah. So when my derivative changes sign, it means that my initial function change direction so it reached its local minimum or local maximum so this point would be local maximum for my initial function this point would be local minimum again these two points x equals minus one and x equals three are yeah. points where my derivative changes sign Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if, um, so why is it maximum if it's at negative one? Why is it minimum at three? Um, because from minus one to three, I can see that my function is decreasing. Yeah. And after that, it begin after point three, it begin to increase. And what happens to okay. you? If you were falling, somewhere you stopped falling and you started climbing up, it means that you reached the lowest point of your travel and you went another direction. So this point, when x equals 3, states for the point of local minimum of my initial function. Oh. Okay, so... We... Because of the direction of a function, the... And direction um, is connected to the sign of the derivative. Negative sign of the derivative states for ne uh, decreasing. Positive sign of the derivative states for increasing. But you don't know the exact point, though, right? Yes. But how do you have because we huh? these lines? These lines, uh, the horizontal lines. Uh, name, you know? I don't have a horizontal lines. These are imaginative lines for this particular case because if I decide to put this point here, yeah, this would be ver vertical horizontal line that states maximum of this function. So it can't pass that line? Yes. So it, it can pass that line, but in this particular point, it was the line that it touched. How do you determine touch the line? How did you determine that line? To determine the line, uh, it's going to be a value of a function at this point. First of all, you need to find this point where your function reaches local minimum or maximum, but you need to find it, its x coordinate. This is exactly what we did based on the derivative function, right? We looked at the derivative. 
and we verified how the derivative function acts at certain um, section at certain ranges of x. For example, from minus infinity to minus one. You see this? From minus one to three. Yeah. We two we looked into the derivative, and this graph pretty clearly gives us values for x. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because remember, values for y of the derivative is related only to the angle of the initial derivative. Oh, not in, sorry guys, I'm, uh, I'm twisting my tongue. So let me clarify it for you. I have function f of x. If yeah. I want to differentiate this function, f prime of x is gonna give me value of a slope, right? Mm -hmm. But f o x gives me some y value, some another y value, not m. For mm -hmm. convenience, we can plot both of those graphs on the same graphing paper with y and x coordinates. Because basically this m, which is the slope of a tangent line, would be equal to y for, for f prime of x. And um, whenever m, remember slope, is negative, it means function is decreasing. Whenever m is positive, it means initial function, this function. So whenever derivative is negative, initial function goes down. Whenever derivative is positive, initial function goes up. Mm -hmm. And we know at this line where we flip our direction, that's the mi local minimum and local maximum, depending on the interval. Yeah. So this is just a sketch that we don't have the exact points, right? Yes, for this particular case, we don't know those uh, points because we would need to have a function um, it would need to have at least some letters to evaluate those points. Okay. For, for this particular case, we just uh, plotting- Random points. Uh, random points, but they would be positioned- Something like that, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And did you note this down? Yeah. Because here, um, yep, uh, there is in your textbooks, you can find a solution for this case, which is very much the same. For this case, don't be confused with that. I took some arbitrary points. Those were just some random points to show you that before those points, for example, function was growing. In between those points, function was decreasing. Then it was growing again after a certain point. Did you get that? Yeah. So here's the key ideas of today's class. And uh, we're gonna practice some problem solving after this. Mm -hmm. um, Yusuf, would you like to sum up what what we discovered today? Uh, sure. So basically, uh, for a function that contains like a differentiable uh, of an interval, uh, if if the f x is increasing, then um, it, like uh, all the values decreases. And if the fx is deep, I mean, yeah, in the opposite way around. So like if the function is increasing on an interval, uh, then it would like the, the, the function would, the graph would go up basically. So how would you connect value of a derivative at an interval to the, rate of change of a function 
that was differentiated. Uh, wait, so wait, question again? Uh, yeah, I apologize. I mean, how would you analyze initial function? Yeah. If you were giving with graph, for example, some derivative of this function, and you were asked to describe how initial function changes over time, whether it grows or whether it decreases. By looking at the function of the derivative, how can you describe initial function? If you know the values of the derivative, for example, you know that sometimes derivative is greater than zero, sometimes derivative is less than zero. Uh, example that we just covered included this method. No, I'm trying. I'm trying to think how to say it. Like, say it in your words. Don't hesitate. We can uh, always. You, you can always correct yourself because um, right now I want you to understand this relation clearly because let's say I have two graphs, okay? This would be F prime of X. Yeah. Of X, and this would be X and f o x I like, I like and let's say uh just give me a second yeah let's say i have derivative and i have uh, i were given just with the graph of the derivative yeah uh and let's say my derivative looks like this okay yeah and uh, i know that the the value that derivative takes so what is f prime of x equal to is important, is important because yeah. it de it it defines where my initial function looks, right? Yeah. And how it defines? Can you tell me? The initial function is basically like uh, it states the the starting point of the graph, right? Uh, initial function uh, is the one that we differentiate. Yeah, the, the, yeah. In order to get this graph. To get the graph, yeah. And once we got this graph, let's say if we pass it on and another person sees it, a person can already make a statement. For example, if our derivative looks like this, that my derivative f prime of x is greater than zero no matter what, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Because it's over x axis, it's above x-axis so it y of this function would never be negative it would also mean that my initial function never changes direction first of all and secondly it would always look upwards it would always grow up because derivative for, for this function would be always positive Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We can do it the other way around. Let's say if my derivative was like this, green, okay? Here I can see that my derivative is always less than zero. So I would say that my initial function was always decreasing. And the other way around, it was increasing. Increasing, yeah. And in this case, I don't know where it started increasing. It may have started increasing here or maybe it's limited to some domain. Who knows? I was just given with this, with this area, with this part of it. And most importantly, I don't know 
where on why this line passes because it can pass like this for example it's still growing all the time right yeah it could pass here it also grows am i right yeah so basically um if you're just given with the graph of the derivative it's not enough to plot exactly the initial function you can only plot its form but not its values Oh, okay, yeah. Because sense. look here. Yeah. I have two functions in a bigger scale. Um, and this is these are going to be my initial functions, right? Yeah. One is going to look like this. Another one is going to look like this. A bit to the right from the initial one. There's one is going to look like this. It's going to be a bit lower from the x-axis. And I would like to ask you, I assume all of these parabolas are the same, but they are just displaced from origin to the no right origin. Or, to, or to the bottom. Tell me, is the derivative different for each one of this? Uh... Yeah, it would be different. Yes, it would be different. Yeah. But we're going to see some pattern that no matter where we place it, we're going to see this line where uh, we're going to find this point where derivative equals zero. Yeah, derivative equals zero, yeah. It's going to be zero for everyone. <coughs> and it's going to be um, for specifically for these two that are above each other. Yeah. I would say that derivative would be the same because... If you sketch a tangent line, but value you, of the yeah. derivative would be the slope of this tangent line. And as yeah. soon as the slope is the same, no matter where you test it, you understand what I mean? Yeah. But once we know that der how derivative looks for this function, we can clearly say that before this point, it was going down. And so before this X point, it was going down, right? Yeah. And after this point, it was going up. We just don't know where exactly it was doing that. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Any questions? No, no I think I just did this. So exercise time. Now it is time to flex our brain because you're going to participate in problem solving. You're going to fix new knowledges you're going to increase the capacity of your brain so guys would you like to give it a try yeah sure so i can solve one of them and the other one would be solved by you okay mm -hmm. which one do you want me to solve the second one Oh, because it's a scary one. <laughs> okay, okay. It's not a problem because you anyway you're gonna have a home assignment. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna um, have these. So determine the points at which derivative equals zero for each of the following function. And I would like to ask you why we would like to know that. Because that's our um our x coordinate. Exactly. Because whenever derivative equals zero, and we know at what value x derivative equals zero, we would know at what value x initial function would reach local minimum or local maximum. In other words, where initial function would change direction. Yeah. Am I clear? Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so remember, in, in our example, we had a parabola like this. Am I right? Something like this. And when graph of the parabola, and this is f prime of x, crosses x-axis, x-intersect, it means that y equals 0. Am I correct? Yeah. And here, y equals <laughs> 0 as well. So that's why we're looking for these points. That's why we're looking when derivative equals zero. 
because before this point, y was greater than zero, and here, y is less than zero. Yeah. Am I clear? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So second one, the function f of x, and we need to find its derivative. I would prefer to list it down first to x minus one to the second power x squared and minus nine. And we differentiate this all together. So here I would have to use the chain rule and the product rule. Am I right? Yeah. So for product rule. I don't think you're using, yeah, yeah, product rule, yeah. So we're gonna have two rules here, product, product rule, product rule, and chain rule. Product rule looks like g prime of x times f of x yeah. plus f prime of x times gx. This is a product rule. Yeah. And chain rule f to the gx prime of derivative of this. Oh, wait. So, yeah, so uh, derivative of this times derivative of the inside function, right? Yeah. And now we just need to see what is chain rule and what is product rule. Chain rule, I'm going to apply to this bracket. And so he, this, in the product rule, f prime of x, for example, is going to be my f of, nah, you see, I'm confusing it with gx. Let's say here it's not gx, but px, okay? p of x. Yes. Yeah. For us, it's going to be different functions. So uh, here we say that f of x for, um, for product rule is uh, f of p of x. This is the our composite function, right? Yeah. And thus, here, we need to differentiate the composite function. And here, we don't need to differentiate composite function. Here, we just need to differentiate the second bracket. This is our g of x. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me clean it up a little bit. And I'm going to list it down here. This is my f of p of x. And this is my g of x. Clear? Yeah. So now let's go ahead and apply those rules. I want to start writing my product rule. Let's write that part of a product where I don't need to differentiate the composite function first, okay? That's how I would like to do it. Let's first differentiate the part that is more simple. Here, I would differentiate g of x. Remember, for product rule, it doesn't matter what position does the derivative takes because we have some. Yeah. So we're going to have two times x. It's the derivative of gx times two x subtract one s square. Plus, now we need to differentiate the composite function. It's going to be two times 2x minus 1. We had power 2, subtract 1, so now it's power 1, times derivative of the inside function, which is 2x minus 1. Derivative of that would be 2. Now we have to multiply this by gx, which is x squared minus 9, and that's it. The last step for us is to simplify it, open the brackets. Yeah. And it would be this part for now, I would like to keep it as it is. 
because it looks massive to me. I don't want to touch it yet. Just yeah. simplify this side. So we're going to have 4 times 2x minus 1 times x squared minus 9. If we open those brackets, you're going to see that I have 2 times x times 2x minus 1 squared plus so do you okay let's multiply first bracket by four to for sake of simplicity so it's going to turn into 8x minus four right mm -hmm. now we're opening the brackets we're going to get 8x to the third power subtract 72x subtract 4x square plus 36. Oh, okay, yeah. So now I definitely want to open this part too to find common terms and simplify them. So here I'm going to have, uh, this is a complete square. So I can use my well-known formula, where is a square subtract 2ab plus b square is going to be 4x square subtract 4x plus 1. And this all times 2x, right? Yeah. So let me just save my energy and don't write it second time. I'm going to write it here. 8 times x square x to the third power right because times 2x now this is going to be 8 to the x square yeah plus 2x now we write down all of the remaining terms it's going to be plus 8x to the third power and subtract 70 2x subtract 4x square plus 36 Next step for me would be to look for common terms. And I have eight here and here. Whenever you see that they're not simplifying for some reason, double check it. Because sometimes, most of the time in exercises, they make you such an equations where it just simplified in a beautiful manner. Like, imagine if here we had the minus, it would be much easier, right? But yeah. we don't. I don't think I made a mistake prior to this. No, I don't think so. So next step would be, this is a common term. X squared is common term. Yeah, combine the common terms. This, we have, this is a common term and one without any coefficient. Yeah. without variable so it's going to be 16x to the third power subtract 12x square plus no subtract 70x plus 36 yeah yeah And then it's the most simplified. Do we find the derivative of that to find zero? No, we, we already found uh, this is the derivative, right? Yeah. We already found the derivative, but now we need to evaluate when this function is equal to zero. Okay. So let me just take this. Did you wrote down the solution yeah. up yeah. to this moment? Yeah. I'm going to move this here. I'm going to clear this. Uh, like this, yep. Now we need to solve this when it's equal to zero. First things first, I would like to simplified by common factor. Do you see a common factor among this? Um, let me just check. 
I think it's going to be two. Yeah. Yeah. So from now, how would you solve such a task? You could use um, derivative. Oh, not derivative, the rules. Can't you use the um, chain rule and the like? Isn't it derivative? Can we use derivative for it? Pardon? Can we find, can't we find the derivative of it? Uh, and what it, what would it give you? Well, let me just check because I, I know how to solve it, but we did, we did a method before how to find it. Let me just check how we did it. Um. Like if we use the power rule for the first one and then a second and third and we scratch out 18. Oh no, you bring it to the, yeah, what if we take the derivative of this? Can we not? No, pattern. Can I take the derivative of this? I think we can. So if we would take a second derivative, basically, it's gonna we already took one, and we're gonna take second derivative of it. We want to find the point of this. Mm. Well, I know I know a way to solve it. It's just not effective. Which way? The one I learned in advanced functions. Let me just check. So I remember we did we did something like this. Yeah, you're supposed to know how to solve uh, exponential functions for zero. So mm, let me yeah. think. Um, So I believe you need to factorize it somehow in order to find roots when this equation equals to zero. You can't. Because this, you can't factor out x because the 18. But remember, for example, for quadratic expression, you can form it in terms of two brackets. Yeah. Well, we could, there's a method you could use called Synthetic division. So you you can fact we can factor out uh, four from the expression. No, thirty five. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So any ideas, guys? No. Well, like, I know of one method, but I don't know if we're allowed to use it. Uh, can you, you're allowed to use any methods you, you like 
theoretically, but what is that you suggest? It's a very long method. Uh, the one you showed in another class? Yeah. Um, mm, the one where you are kind of... The one I had troubles with, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of recall it. I'm just seeing if it, it'll work. Okay, so, so if, yep. if um, you, here, I'll do it like this. It, it'll work. You take a negative three here because one of the factors of 18 is negative three. And then you plug it in here, you get you put your, the coefficients, so you put eight, negative six, 35, 18. You bring it down and then you multiply it. You get negative 24, you add this you get negative 30 you multiply um, it you... Uh, the i believe you can do this because this method uh is pretty much uh, what is it ultimate but the greater the power of the expression the more time you need for the calculations right and now mm -hmm. we're at certain stage when it's really becoming too much of a time, right? Yeah. So for now, I'm gonna tell you how how this ex expression is factorized, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like you to review methods that you may know before, but we're also going to cover this, I think in our next class, I would dedicate some time at the beginning. How you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. So factorization. Uh, so this is simply um, way of so way of simplifying it or finding the roots is only to factorize it. And in this case, uh, we can rewrite this part as follows: as three brackets, two, um, two. Uh, sorry, 2 plus x, 2x minus 1, and 4x minus 9 equals 0. Did you get it? Yeah. So this would be our factorization of this expression. Now, to evaluate when it's equals to 0, we just need to solve it when any one of these brackets is equal to zero. Because remember, anything times zero is zero. Am I How right? Did you, did you figure that out or you just, you just told us the answer? I, I Right now, I just told you the answer because it's, it, it, if we're not conveni convenient with it right now, it's whole another section to explain. Yeah. So right now, uh, we're just looking to the, algorithm method of uh, evaluating the function based on the derivative, right? Yeah. Way, way of factorizing exponential function of third power is just one of the tools in calculus. It's not why we're learning this course, right? Mm -hmm. For example, because in another case, you can have a x squared plus x, for example, instead of third power. 
And for this one, you already know how to find solution or how to factorize it. Yeah. So we're going to have three roots that are satisfying our requirement for the derivative to be equal to zero. And first one is going to be negative two, right? Second one would be positive one over two. Am I correct? Yeah. And third one would be positive nine over four. Is it clear? So this would be answer when this function equals zero. Okay. And derivative equals zero. And Alan, can you remind me what it means when derivative equals zero? The x intercept. Hmm? X intercepts. Uh yes, but what it means for initial function that we differentiated. When derivative equals zero, the initial function reaches its oh. local. Oh, local min or max? Yes. So these x values would be points on our coordinate system that would respond for the moment in x in x axis when our initial function changes direction right yeah when it reaches maximum or minimum maybe maximum again here yeah is it clear yeah alan yeah so let's not waste time on the example A, solve it by yourself. Here, let me clear all the drawing. In this particular exercise, we are asked to plot this function by using the graphing calculator. Um, and inspect the graph to estimate where the function is increasing and where it's decreasing. Verify your estimates with al algebraic solutions. So as, we already covered algebraic solutions, right? Because the thing we just did before, when we define uh, when derivative positive, when derivative negative, when it's equals to zero. That's the algebraic approach. Right? We, which one of these functions would you like to plot in the graphing calculator? I have uh, so, um, software to do it for you now. Probably D. D you would like to see? Yeah. So can I ask you to dictate me what D looks like? Um, what it says? X subtract one over. X subtract one over. X squared plus three. X squared plus, plus three. That's it? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Just a second. Oh, yeah, I got it. Enlarge. A 
let me stop sharing and share new screen now. So here is our function. Can you see it now? Yeah. This is a very convenient uh, online resource called Wolfram. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and analyze where on this graph, based on this graph, wait, sorry, is this? Where the, uh, inspect the graph to estimate where the function is increasing. Graph to estimate where if the function is increasing, where is, okay. So looking at this graph, uh, what you can say about it? At what area does it goes up and where it goes down? Very, very slightly. You could see right here is uh, like a local minimum. Okay. Wait a second, let me just try. Here, right here. Yeah, and then over here, you can also see it it's very tiny. And then you can just point out the obvious one and then the, uh, yeah, somewhere here. Yeah, and there's also a very obvious one um right like well in the middle of these mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so he, somewhere here we see points where function changes direction and before this point how would you describe this function how it moves um decreasing from negative infinity till mm -hmm. Let's say negative one. Great. So going down. Yeah. So then, from negative one to let's say two point five. It's increasing. So growing up. And then from negative two from two point five to negative infinity, it's decreasing. From so, two point five to positive infinity. Positive infinity, yes, yeah, sorry. So I would like to, it's it's absolutely right, Alan. Thank you so much. I would like to give you an advice. Yeah. How you can use this conveniently. So let's say you have a table. You construct a table in which you would like to list sign that the function takes, uh, sign that the derivative takes specifically. You can use this table for many purposes. In this table, you can say when x equals zero, they're gonna give you a minimum and maximum points. But you also can use it to list, for example, uh, here you can state the range, x, for example, from one to negative one. And here you can state another range, x from one to, infinity okay and here below it you would say that derivative of prime of x equals oh uh, less or greater than zero as well you're gonna do it for the other section in this case it, sh it should be logical that if i separated it into two areas that something happened at point one. So if I say that my function was decreasing below that moment, it means that after point one, it should increase. The next line, what you're gonna say, you can just represent it as a arrow pointing up or down. In in this, I, I like to point it on an angle, right, inclined. So when derivative is less than zero, direction of uh, rate of change is negative. Oh, so sorry, not the rate of change, but uh, direction of movement or 
change delta y is going to be negative, right? Delta y, change of the function. Guys? Yeah. So, yep. So, please take your notes. Uh, and I'm going to text you your home assignment. Thank you for today's class. Uh, let me just jump back to our presentation real quick. So, yep. Today we discover. Let, let's just make a quick review. Today we looked into um, curve sketching using knowledges about derivatives. We discovered how derivative related to the curve, yeah. right? And um, we practice few examples together. And I would like you to practice some more examples. Here, for example, you're already given with factorized derivative. Can you tell me the answer right away? Because it should be pretty obvious. When is the derivative equal zero? X one. X, X equals one, X equals negative two, X equals negative three. Great. And then you're asked to determine the values of X for which the function F is increasing and the values of X for which the function is decreasing. So once you know these points, you know that in this point, you got a deflection, let's call it such way, right? That means in between these points, your function was acting like this yeah. or the other way around like this. Yeah. Right. And to evaluate how exactly it looked like, you need to find sign of a function between one and minus two, between minus two and minus three, before, yeah. min before one, so, or before minus three, I would say. Take a look at what sign does every one of these brackets takes, right? For example, if we take four, I can say that this is positive, this is positive, and this is positive. Thus, when x equals four, my function is growing. Mm -hmm. Four is greater than one. So after point one, my function is always growing so if this was one this was minus two this was minus three according to the coordinate system right yeah so i would say that after one my function is growing now let's take zero i check with zero this is going to be negative this is going to be positive and third term is going to be positive again but I know negative times positive is always negative. So in zero, my function goes down. And zero is located between one and minus two. Am I correct? Yeah. So here, function would decrease. Next, I'm going to check a point between minus two and minus three. And it's going to be, for example, negative 1.5. Oh, no, sorry, negative... 2.5, for example. Negative 2.5, this gives us negative. Negative 2.5, this gives us negative. Uh, the way we did it at school, I was, you can write like plus, plus, plus means positive or minus, minus, plus means these two are taking negative values. Yeah. I yeah. Know. So once they're both taking negative values, it means that in product, they're going to give me a positive value that it goes up. Yeah. And now you can guess that before minus three, function going to decrease. Okay. I already solved this with you together, guys. Please review it on your own at home. And thank you for participating in today's class and looking forward to see you in the next one. No, thank you. Have a great afternoon, guys. Good luck.